We are in part two of a series called God With Us. And one of the things we're doing is all this series long, for this, this uh, next couple of weeks or so, we are uh, uh, just looking at a text. We're starting with a text from the New Testament that's sort of an anchor for us. And for those of you that are followers of Christ, it's one of the most important verses concerning the presence of God in our lives. It's Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where Matthew said this, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, everybody say it with me, God with us. Our series is called God with us. And we looked last week at how we experience the presence of God in the valley. And if you were with us last week, you, you remember that we talked about the truth that, that we enjoy God on the mountaintops, but we really get to know Him intimately in the valley. It's those deep, difficult times that we get to know Him in a different way. And today, I want to talk about another metaphor from Scripture, and that is the wilderness. How do we experience God's presence in the wilderness? The wilderness is different than the, from the valley because time in the wilderness usually last a, a, a lot longer. The wilderness is a barren place. It's a dry place, a desolate place where you, you feel very alone. And, you know, one of the images that's often found in the wilderness is this idea of wandering through the wilderness. And, and while we're wandering, we're, we're wondering when in the world this is going to be over. We're wondering when are we going to get out of this wilderness? And some of you right now may be in some kind of a wilderness. You're you're stuck in a job and it's, it's a really bad situation and you're wondering, should I stay in this job? Or maybe even worse, you're living through a nightmare of a marriage and you wonder what you should do next because you just don't see any hope in that situation. Or maybe you're walking through a wilderness with a, with a wayward, rebellious child and you're wondering if you're ever going to get out of that wilderness. Or maybe you're, you're dealing with a horrible illness in yourself or in a, in a loved one and you just can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, and you just kind of feel stuck in that place. And it, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. We, we often feel alone. We, we feel lost. We feel disoriented. We feel like nobody really understands what we're going through in the wilderness. You know, what's so interesting to me, when you look at the scripture, is that wilderness stories in the Bible often follow mountaintop experiences. Wilderness experiences often follow mountaintop experiences. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. You know, he had a mountaintop moment with God right after he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. You remember that moment? Heaven literally opens up and the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove. And his father verbally and publicly expresses his love and approval for his son. He said, this is my son whom I, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. It's, it's a moment where the father is saying he's proud of his son. It's a mountaintop experience. And then the very next verse, it says, immediately Jesus was driven into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. Mountaintop followed by wilderness. Maybe that's been your experience in your life. Maybe you've had that situation. Things were just going great and then you found out someone wasn't being honest with you and suddenly you're in the wilderness. You thought your spouse was being faithful, and, but your spouse wasn't being faithful and now you're in the wilderness. Or you find yourself in a financial wilderness. You're trying. Maybe you've been there where you're trying and trying and trying to get out of this debt and you just feel so desperately and Whatever you do, it just doesn't seem to work. And you, you've tried to tell people how you feel, but you just, they just don't seem to understand. And you feel alone and you feel spiritually dry. You feel desperate in the wilderness. Well, what I want to do today is show you one big thought. And then we're, we're going to come back to it again and again and again. And I pray that it'll sink into your heart and you'll be able to grab hold of this today if you're walking through a wilderness. And that big thought is this. As much as it hurts... Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. In, in fact, I'm going to show you a story from the Old Testament where this is lived out in a very real way. It's in 1 Kings chapter 19. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, we see Elijah the prophet. And we know Elijah the prophet, God used him in massive ways. And Elijah experienced the power of God literally on the mountaintop, on top of Mount Carmel. 
And almost immediately after that, we see him go from the mountaintop to the wilderness where he's desperate, where he's depressed, where he feels all alone and he's scared for his life. To give you a little context uh, for the, what we're going to read, there is this evil king in Israel named King Ahab. Now, King Ahab was really bad in his own right, but he had an even more evil wife named Jezebel. In fact, I mean, Jezebel has become uh, associated in our culture with, with an evil person, you know? It, you know. Nobody names their child after Jezebel, right? That'd be a little weird. What'd you name her? Jezebel. Oh, okay. That'd be just a little freaky, right? But well, when Jezebel heard about all that Elijah had done because he had defeated the prophets of Baal and they had been killed, killed and the reason they were prophets of Baal were because Jezebel was a worshiper of Baal. And, and when she heard about all that Elijah had done, she got so angry and le- essentially she said to her husband, look, if you can't do this job right, then get out of my way and let a woman do it. Somebody, somebody said, somebody, anybody ever said that before? Uh, don't, don't, don't answer that question. But in it, she says, she says out loud, she says, send word to Elijah that by this time tomorrow, he's going to be dead. She threatened him. Now, King Ahab had been his enemy for years and for, for, for years and years and years, he had been coming after him. And, and Elijah was never afraid, never backed down. But as soon as a woman got mad, Elijah got scared. So this is what the Bible says, chapter 19 of 1 Kings, verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And I want to pause for just a second because uh, uh, when, you, when we just read the text, we don't have any idea of the, of the geographical layout. And so you may not understand just how far this brother ran, but to run to Be- Beersheba, to run there. Listen, this is days before Uber, right? He was on foot, man. And, and uh, he runs about 100 miles to get away from this crazy, angry woman. The prophet, he just turns into Forrest Gump. I was running. He had, he had, he just out of dodge. He's getting out of there. He's scared. He runs 100 miles. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left a servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He was just on the mountaintop. But where did he end up? He ran into the wilderness where he's alone, where he's scared, where he's hurting, where he's desperate. It says he came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. And then he said the words that so many of us in this room have said, or at least we felt it, even if we didn't say it out loud at some point in our lives, or maybe you're you're feeling this now. He said, I've had enough, Lord. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. I've had enough, Lord. I just can't take it anymore. Elijah had put up a battle. He had, he had fought with bravery. He had faith. He had courage. But he, now he's just at the end of his rope. I've had enough, Lord. And I'm certain with a group this size and the people that are watching the live stream, I'm sure certain that there are some of you that at some point in your life, and maybe, as I said, even now, you have said those very words. You've said, I'm done. I've, I'm spent. I've had enough. I can't take it anymore. I've had enough, Lord. Some of you are in a work situation where the straw finally broke the proverbial camel's back and you just feel like you can't take it anymore. You just can't take another day in that situation Financially, you're trying to get ahead and you're, you, you, you start making prog- progress and then all of a sudden the car breaks, right? Anybody been there? And then on top of that, then the washing machine goes on the fritz. And then your two, two-year-old puts a tic-tac up his nose and you have to go to the emergency room to get it removed. I mean, and, you, and, you're, and you're like, what is all this, God? I just can't take it anymore. And you feel overwhelmed. Sometimes... It's the accumulation of things and it's the smallest thing that sets it off. You know, like maybe you work hard and you serve faithfully and you make the greatest meal ever in the history of the world for your family and you put it out on the table. You have prepared it with great love and then your family eats it in like 30 seconds and leave all the dishes on the table. And so you turn into Jezebel, you know, <laughs> or you know what I'm saying? Because then in that moment you're saying, by, by this time tomorrow, this family will be dead if this house is not clean. Anybody can relate with that one? You know what I'm talking about. 
but you just can't take it anymore. Well, apparently this is what happened to Elijah the prophet because let me tell you what, this man had experienced the presence of God. This guy had fought with bravery, with boldness. He had stood in the face of danger and he stood for God and he proclaimed what was right. In fact, if you don't know the backstory, he stood down the evil king Ahab and he prophesied and he called for a drought as a punishment for the king's sins. And sure enough, God stopped the rain. And well, after that, the king is mad at Elijah. So he sends all of his forces out to get Elijah to kill him. And, and he hides for three years and God is protecting him. He, God miraculously feeds him through ravens from heaven. And then God uses Elijah to eventually he uses Elijah to bring a dead boy back to life. And this prophet then stands down 850 false prophets of Baal and he calls down fire from heaven and God shoots fire down on the sacrifice and consumes the sacrifice and consumes the altar that it was on and consumes all the water that had been poured on it. And then he destroys all these false prophets. And then Elijah eventually calls and he, uh, on God and he asks God to make it rain. And he sees in the distance finally a cloud the size of a man's hand. And he has the faith to believe that God is bringing the provision of rain and God does it. Elijah had, ex I want you to get this, Elijah had experienced the protection of God. He had experienced the provision of God and he knew very well the presence of God. He had experienced God's greatness. And then when one moment makes a threat, he runs for his life. And I'll tell you right now, there's not a single man in this place laughing at that. <laughs> they're, they're looking straight forward saying, I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor Dave. I don't know what you're talking about. But Elijah runs for his life. Some of you feel this way right now. You're saying, I've had enough. I just can't take anymore. I'm just exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. I'm doing the best that I can, but the best that I can do just isn't enough. You know, Dr. Henry Cloud, a Christian psychologist, one time he was talking with a group of church leaders, and they were, they were all experiencing the same thing that many of you may be experiencing right now, because they were all talking at this conference, and they were all saying, well, we're just tired, man. We're, we're all just tired. We're tired, we're tired, we're tired, we're tired. And, and I mean, everybody here at Restoration Life Church, you're tired. I know that. That's true. Those of you who are worshiping with us on the live stream, you're, you're tired. Actually, down here in the South, we're not tired. We're, we're tarred right? We got to get this right. We're in Arkansas, man. So we, we're, we're just plain tarred. You know what I'm saying? Well, how you doing? I'm tarred. How do you spell that? Tarred, T-A-R-D. <laughs> you know, that's how we do it. But, but Dr. Cloud, listen to this. I'm just having fun there, but listen. Uh, Dr. Cloud said to these men, he said that they were probably misdiagnosing their real challenge because he said, most of us are not tired. That's not the real issue. Because if you were tired, you could take a nap and that would solve your problem. How many of you have taken a nap and realized it didn't help? For many of us, we're not simply in need of physical rest as much as we're in need of spiritual replenishment. We're not just tired. We're spiritually depleted. This needs to speak to some of us in this place today. You're not just tired. You're not just overwhelmed. What you need is an encounter with the very real and very holy presence of God. What you need is an intimate moment where you experience the grace, the goodness, the loving kindness, the mercy and the presence of God. You're not just tired. Maybe you do need some rest. Maybe some physical rest would do you some good. But, but even more than just physical rest, you need, it to, you need to encounter the presence of God. You need spiritual replenishment. This is what David said in Psalm 23. One of the most beloved Psalms of all the, of the scripture. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. But what's that next line? He restores my soul. Not just tired, not just worn out, but we need the restoring grace of God to our souls not just physically exhausted, but spiritually depleted. So, so what does God do for Elijah? What I love is what God doesn't do. God doesn't preach him a sermon, 
saying, this is your fault, you're just an idiot, you're a moron, you're, you know, this is all your fault. Not only that, God doesn't give him 10 verses to memorize. He doesn't give him bumper sticker theology, which is my favorite here in America. You know, what we, what, if he were like a lot of us on Facebook or uh, somebody said, man, I'm really hurting. If God had done like we do, we'd be like, well, hey, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And you're like, what are you talking about? You know, he doesn't look at Elijah and condemn him and say, man, where's your faith? Haven't you, don't you know where I've just had you, what, you, what I just accomplished through, through you? Where is your faith? What does he do? God tells Elijah to eat and to rest. That's what God says. Look, look what scripture says, verses 5 and 6. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some baked bread, probably Gluten-free for those of us that are worried. Um, and uh, uh, baked over hot coals in a jar of water. And he ate and drank and then lay down again. What did God say? Listen, essentially, listen. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is rest in the presence of God. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a breather and let God restore your soul. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. And I love that because I don't know about you, but there are a lot of times in my life I don't get it the first time. Anybody besides me? Anybody here? You got a thick skull like I've got? I don't always get it the first time, but God comes back a second time and a third time because the presence of God continues to pursue you. There are those of you today, God is coming back for you again. And if, and if you don't get it today, then he's going to come back again tomorrow. Look at verse 8. So he got up and he ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? I love that. What are, you, what are you doing here? Why are you running away? Does, does, does God speak to any of you that way? He, he speaks to me that way a lot of times. You know, what, what, do, you, what do you think you're doing, Dave? What, what are you up to? What, you know better than this. What are you, what are you doing right now? You, you have access to me. You have access to my power. You have access to my spirit. Why are you running away from people? And why are you running away from God? What are you doing here? And then Elijah, he starts getting all whiny voiced and starts complaining to God. And I don't, I don't know if anybody here ever gets whiny voiced when you're talking to God. Anybody, you know what I'm talking about? But it, it, I don't know if you do, but I get whiny voiced sometimes when I feel like God's not answering my prayers or, or when God's not doing what I want him to do. And I, I get whiny voiced. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody here with toddlers, you know what I'm talking about. He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. I don't know that he said it that way, but this is how I read it. God, I've been working so hard. Why don't you hear my prayer? Why, why don't you do this for me? Whiny voice. Maybe I'm the only one who gets whiny voice. I don't know because you're all looking at me really weird right now. Um, but Elijah gets whiny voice. He says, the Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down the altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. See, Elijah was in a spiritual wilderness. He's hurting. His need is so great that he cannot see beyond his own need. Nobody understands. Nobody's doing it the way that I'm doing it. Nobody's really serving God faithfully. I'm all alone. I'm, I'm desperate. And what does God do? God meets him at the point of his deepest need. God ministers to him in his moment of vulnerability. God doesn't call him out and say, man, you sound like a toddler. But he brings healing in the middle of the hurt. And that's why I hope you'll understand that your deepest need can become a gift when it drives you to depend on God. 
And God comes to him again and again and again and reaches out to him in his deepest need. And I love verse 11, really verse 11 and 12. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And I'm sure he's thinking to himself, man, that is exactly what I need. I need God's presence. I've been, I'm scared for my life. I just need God's presence. God is going to reveal himself to me. Man, I'm so glad he's going to reveal himself. He's going to pass by. It says, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. And he's thinking to himself, God has got to be in this wind. God's coming in this rushing and this mighty wind. But the scripture says, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. Well, surely God is, was in the shaking of the ground. Surely he's going to be in this earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. Ah, oh, this has got to be it. I mean, this is how he appeared to Moses at the burning bush. Surely God is coming in this fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. The ground shook and the earth wasn't in the shaking of the ground. The wind raged and though God was not in the wind. The fire burned. And God was not in the fire. Earth, wind, and fire. You see what God did there? <laughs> for that was, God did that for all you born in the 70s. And if you don't know what, I'm, what everybody else is giggling up at, just go ahead and be 18 and, and just enjoy it. You have a lot of time to get older and you'll get more jokes later as you go on in life. But here's the thing. God was not in the remarkable. God was in the ordinary. In the whisper. God was in the whisper. Why is it that when life is so difficult, God's voice is so quiet? Why is his voice so still and so small? I mean, if God wants us to hear him, why does he whisper? What, 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 what does, why doesn't he shout? Why doesn't he speak in, in loud and spectacular ways? If he wants us to know him and to hear him, why does he whisper? I'll tell you why. God whispers because he's close. God whispers because he's close. He whispers because he's right there with you. He whispers because he's near. You see, the devil shouts his, uh, all of his lies, but God whispers his truth. God doesn't shout to get your attention. He whispers to draw you close. And what does he say to you? He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I've been with you every single moment of your life. And I love you more than you can imagine. When you hurt, I hurt with you. I'm with you in the valley. I'm with you in the wilderness. I'm with you in the storm. Why does God whisper? He whispers because he's right there. He's close. Let me ask you this. Where do you want to be when you're afraid? Let me ask, ask a better question. Anybody here ever afraid of a storm when you were growing up? Maybe you were a little kid and, and there'd be a big storm that would blow in. Anybody got a, get afraid of those moments? And where do, where do little kids like to go in the moment of the storm? Anybody? Right? They can ride straight to mom and dad's bed. Right? Because they want to be close to the ones who make them feel safe. You know, I have a very vivid memory of one time when my grandmother, my grandma Chloe, was, was spending the night with us. And, and I, I was the one that that night got to sleep in the bed with her. We all had to take turns when she was there. And I remember a storm came and, and the thunder was going and I didn't understand. I didn't even know what a tornado was, you know, but there was all this tornado watch and all this stuff going on. And I remember lying in bed and I was afraid, but my grandmother was right there. And I remember just asking her, Grandma, is the storm going to get us? And she just called me down and she said, no, it's not going to get us. We'll be just fine. And I went to sleep because we want to go where we feel safe. 
Well, listen, in the middle of the storm, you don't have to run to God's bed because he's already with you. He's already right there. He's close. And if your heart is hurting right now, if you feel brokenhearted, then where is God? Let me tell you exactly where he is. Scripture tells us in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Why does he whisper? He whispers because he's close. He whispers because he's near. He whispers because he is with you. David said this in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley, now the valley is not my destination, I'm just passing through. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me because he will never leave me. He will never forsake me he is always close your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies i love that 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 light line there because the way i read that is that god sets a table before me and makes my enemies watch while i eat you anoint my head with oil my cup overflows surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and i shall dwell in the house of the lord forever why does god whisper to his sheep he whispers because he's close god knows his sheep by name and his sheep know his soft and gentle voice david said of god's presence where can i go from your spirit where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Your right hand will hold me fast. How close is the presence of God that he can hold you in his hand? Why do God, does God whisper? Because he's close. Because he's close. And then one day you'll discover that your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. He's close. What you need to hear is that God loves you and he is for you. He's reaching out to you, bringing you to himself. He has plans for you, plans to bless you and to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. You are valuable to him. He cares for you so much that he sent his son Jesus and now God's spirit dwells within you. God is working in your life and he has supernatural plans to use you and to bless you. He is always with you, even when you've been away from him, even when you've been running hard away from him. He has never left you and forsake, forsaken you. He's still been chasing you down. He's still been calling your name. He's still been whispering, come home, come home. He's always close. He's always close. Always close. I want to tell you about a young woman named Mandy. Mandy had been sick for a while and she was not able to stand up and all through a worship service because uh, she'd come to church. She just didn't have the strength. She was so sick. Her father, Craig Rochelle, he's a pastor of, of Life Church in Oklahoma. And, and one day she was talking with her father and she said, or excuse me, he said to her, he said, I think the devil is attacking your body because God's called you to do so much. And she looked at him and she said, Daddy, I don't know, that, that may be true. But she said, but I actually think God chose me for this. His father was really taken aback by that statement and he said, what, what, what do you mean God chose you for this? She said, well, I believe God chose me for this. And, and he said, well, explain to me. She said, well, well, look at what has happened through my sickness. She said, I'm ministering to thousands of people now every single week through uh, the YouTube channel. And I, I never would have had a voice into their lives. But now I get to speak into their lives every single week because of my sickness. And she said, and look how close I am to Jesus right now. 
She said, look at how my marriage is, is blessed. And she said, we're so dependent on God that we have to have his presence moment by moment, day by day. And then she looked at her father and she said, God is going to heal me. I believe that. And she said, and I will tell everybody all about his goodness. I will tell everybody, you know, I will. God chose me for this. And they both started crying. She went on and she said, now, now don't get me wrong, daddy. I wouldn't want anybody else to go through what I've, been, what I've been through. And I never want to go through it again. But she said, but I wouldn't change a thing because of how close I am to God. Makes me think of a friend, a good friend of mine, whose name is Judy from South Carolina, who went through bottle, battled breast, breast cancer. And she told about moments sitting in her living room, curled up on, her, on, a, a, on a rocking chair as she began to cry and pray, call out to God. And, but she just began to sense His presence nearer than she'd ever felt. And she, she later on, she said, boy, I never want to go through that again. But boy, did I get to know Jesus during that time. Here's what I hope you'll understand. We, we enjoy Him on the mountaintops but we get to know Him intimately in the valleys. And when we're wandering in the wilderness, and we feel like nobody understands. He understands. He cares. And he is always, always good. He wasn't in the booming earthquake. He wasn't in the rushing wind. He wasn't in the raging fire. Where was He? He was in the whisper. He was in the whisper. And if you'll stop for a moment from the rush of this world and you'll dig a ditch, we talked about it last week, if you make a well, then you'll be ready for the presence of God and He will meet you there. Why do I say that? Because who is He? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call Him Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Why does our God whisper? God whispers because He's close. Would you bow your head and let me take just a moment to pray with you. Father, we ask that in Your presence that You would minister grace to us, Your peace, Your goodness, Your grace, Your mercy. We're looking to You today, God. As you're praying right now, with nobody looking around, I want to just take a moment and ask you, are you wandering now in a wilderness? And those who would say, Pastor Dave, pray for me right now. I'm kind of in a desert right now. I'm, I'm in a wilderness right now. I just don't know where to go. I just feel lost. I feel alone. I feel scared. And would you just, if that's you and you'd say, I'm in a wilderness, just slip your hand up right where you are. Yes. Boy, they're all over the place. All over the place. I'm going to pray for you in a moment. You can put your hands right back down, but let me ask another question. Maybe there are those of you here who would say, Pastor, I, I, I'm not in a wilderness right now. I, I don't feel like I am, but, but no matter where I am, I, I want to be even more aware of that still, small, quiet voice of my God. I want to hear His whisper and if you're a Jesus follower, I hope that, that that's you. But if it's you, would you just slip your hand up right where you are and say, Pastor, pray for me. I, I want to I hear that whisper. I want to hear him. I want to hear that gentle voice. Father, I pray first of all for those who are in the wilderness right now. God, I ask that, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would reveal yourself in the whisper. That God, that they won't waste time looking for the big moment, for the earthquake, for the raging fire, for the, for, the, the, for the wind, the raging wind, Lord God. But instead, we would silence ourselves and still ourselves and, and listen carefully because I know that you are whispering. And the reason you're whispering is because you are near. You have never walked away. You will never walk away. You've never given up on us. You're right here, right now. You're speaking to us very clearly. And you're whispering into the souls of people in this very moment. And you're saying, I'm here. I'm close. Stop running. Stop chasing other things. Stop trusting in other things. 
Stop looking to people for, for answers. Start looking to me. I'm here. I'm close. God, show us that you are with us, that you care. Show us that your grace is enough. Be our rock when our world is unstable. Be our strength when we are weak. God, be our comfort when we are hurting. And may your presence, God, be enough for us. And God, for those today who say, I want to hear God's voice, I pray, God, that they would be willing to just carve up some time, carve out some time and set it aside and just say to you, God, I want to meet with you. I need your presence. I need you moment by moment. Scripture says when you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. You will find him, Scripture says, when you seek him with your whole heart. And friend, if you will be quiet, and if you will listen, you will hear the gentle whisper of a good God who is always with you, and he's always close. Father, I pray right now that you would let the peace of God that passes understanding invade the hearts and minds of everybody listening, whether they're in this room, whether on the live stream, that God, that we would sense the peace of God flooding our lives, that even if we are in the wilderness, we know you're with us. And just as you provided for Elijah, you'll provide for us. Just as Elijah experienced your presence, we'll experience your presence. And God, I pray that there would be some who would, be, who would look at their lives and say, you know what, I need, I need to do something very spiritual. I need to just rest in His presence and let God restore my soul. And Lord, I pray that as we do that, that we would experience the healing touch of God, that even though circumstances may change, our hope would be renewed. Our strength would be renewed. And the peace of God would reign and rule in our lives. Give us that peace that makes no sense to anybody else, that passes human understanding. To know that you're in charge, you're in control, and you're near. You're close. Help us, God, to hear your whisper. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.